This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. This week, I'm speaking to gardener, TV presenter, author, government advisor, and wildlife and environment advocate, amongst other things, Chris Baines. Chris designed the first ever wildlife garden at the Chelsea Flower Show in 1985, which was swiftly followed by his best-selling book, How to Make a Wildlife Garden, so I thought it would be a perfect time to speak to Chris, given the continuing interest in wild gardens that we witnessed again at this year's Chelsea. My first question to Chris was whether or not people have truly woken up to the idea of wildlife gardening, since his garden and his book entered the public consciousness. Well... 1985, the, I mean, Chelsea Flower Show was, was all about the biggest and the best. And my little wildlife garden was a complete revolution. I mean, I remember the very first day when you allocated your plot at Chelsea and it's, it's football fields the rest of the year. So it's quite bizarre. You arrive and told this is your little patch and my patch had a, a corner post and white lines on it. You know, it was, it was just a patch of grass. And I spent my first day going around and digging up daisies from other people's uh, Chelsea garden plots and transplanting them into my lawn because I wanted daisies and cowslips in my lawn. And, and that was just such a complete contrast. And if you go to Chelsea Flower Show now, almost every show garden has got wildflowers in it. Uh, it's you know full of primroses and, and foxgloves. So there's been a big shift in the acceptability, I think, of, of wildflowers in gardens. But I think it's much more than that. I think there was, I, I remember one of the conversations that I kept having with people uh, around that, that little Chelsea garden was about a big pot of broad beans that I'd grown. And uh, clearly they were not going to produce beans in the four or five days of Chelsea Fair Show. But when I talk to people about what fantastic perfume they had uh, as broad bean flowers and how brilliant they were for watching bees uh, opening the flowers and getting in there, that gave people a completely different kind of view of what their garden was for. You know, it was, it was, it was at a time when productivity was we were still kind of in the shadow of dig for victory i suppose to some extent and and uh, striped lawns and immaculate gardens were what everybody aspired to and and to be able to talk to people about how important for me anyway the bird song was uh, and how important it was to see butterflies and bees on the flowers not just to look at the flowers that whole conversation was really quite new then um, and now it's absolutely mainstream. I mean, the, the, something like half a billion people do the big garden bird watch every year for for the RSPB and the uh, British Trust for Ornithology. So there's been a massive shift towards seeing our gardens as places where we can be intimately engaged with nature. And I just don't think that was the case then. It, it was much more about a two-dimensional visual view of things than hearing it and seeing it and having a sense that the seasons were changing and, and that your garden could be a place that reflected that. Mm. Yeah, I wonder what you think. Obviously, you mentioned that a lot of gardens now at Chelsea have that wild look to them. Um, do you worry that that could be a trend rather than a long-term shift in perspective? Well, 40 years is, is quite a long time for a, for a growing trend. Um, I, I think, if anything, in the last 18 months, my kind of view of gardens, the, the kind of gardening with nature rather than against it, shall we, shall we say, has had a great boost, if anything. I think many, many people who've been in lockdown, stuck with their immediate environment, spending more time in their garden, uh, are missing access to the wider countryside. I've really begun to realize how much pleasure there is in, in actually having a bird feeder in the garden or a pond that gets visited by dragonflies. I mean, I, I think there's been a, a great increase in that very immediate access to nature. And for those of us who are lucky to have gardens, the garden is the place that you can really make that happen. So I, I, I don't think it's a trend. I think, if anything, it's, it's going to get stronger stronger. 
and all of the kind of wider debates about the need to work with nature, um, whether it's to do with flood management or uh, reclaiming the seabeds or any of the other kind of things that I'm, I'm involved with on a wider front, they're all basically saying the same thing. We can't keep on destroying nature because we depend on it. And therefore, we have to do more than just hang on to the fragments to the left. We have to begin to rebuild and restore. And um, that's, I think that's the trend, if anything, that we're going to now start to see much more habitat restoration, habitat creation on the, in the wider landscape. Um, and gardens will be a part of that and continue to be a part of that. And, and if you just look in the garden centres, I mean, the change, the garden centres themselves have appeared in that time. Uh, when I first started working in horticulture, there were no garden centres. Basically, you went and looked at the shrubs you fancied in the summer, you ordered them, and then in the, in the autumn they were dug up and delivered to you, or you went and collected them. And then peat and plastic pots revolutionised all of that. Uh, but if you look at garden centres today, they're full of information about how to get more wildlife into your garden. And of course, they're also full of how to kill the ants and how to kill the wasps and how to kill a few other things. But essentially, there is lots of, of indication that the customers of garden centres are looking for ways to encourage nature in their gardens rather than to discourage it. Mm, well, yes, long may that continue. Um, you talk in your book, uh, again, How to Make a Wildlife Garden, about the, uh, the, the importance of a garden which mimics a woodland edge. And you've got a photo in there of your parents' garden, and it is just idyllic. I would love that garden. It's fantastic. But why do you think the woodland edge is such a desirable kind of area to, to create? Um, well, I think uh, I'm glad you like my garden. Uh, it, it's it's really quite tiny, uh, and uh, the most striking thing about it, I think, apart from this kind of sheltered, enclosed sense that, of the woodland glade ceiling, is that it doesn't have a lawn; it has a big pond in the middle of it. So it's unusual, and it's the front garden that, that the photographs of. It's not the back garden, so it's uh, it's unusual in in some respects. But it's right in the middle of the city of Wolverhampton. You know, and I'm. 10 minutes walk from Mars Spencer's here. I'm not out in the countryside. But if you look, if you fly over many areas of urban and suburban Britain, certainly it's true here in, in this bit of the, the, uh, the Midlands, you're flying over a forest, basically. You're flying over a conti- more or less continuous canopy of street trees and park trees and garden trees and fruit trees. Um, and the wildlife reflects that. So the the reason that we have such fantastic dawn choruses in, in urban and suburban Britain is because the birds that sing loudest in the British Isles are woodland birds. And if you think about it, they have to sing loud because they can't see one another in the world. So they have to kind of tell the neighbours that where they are. So the, the wildlife that lives in an urban forest or any other kind of broadly forest um, is the kind of wildlife that you can best encouraged to visit your garden and if you go into a, an area of natural woodland and you want to see the greatest variety of wildlife then you go to the gaps in the canopy to the glades where the sun gets through and there are butterflies along the edges um, and where the whole of uh, the natural history of the woodland congregates around those gaps so that's why i would argue that if you can create that kind of woodland glade feel to your garden with shelter around the edges, plenty of cover around the edges so that the hedgehogs that travel around the edges can get from one garden to another so that the black have shrubs to nest in so that the butterflies can actually find the food plants they need to their eggs on. Then, then actually what you'll get is the best your neighborhood has got to offer. And really gardening with wildlife is all about creating a kind of service station for the for the wildlife in the neighbourhood, and if you do it right, then the, the, the natural history of your neighbourhood will come and visit your garden, and you'll enjoy it outside your window. Yeah, uh, thinking about marginal habitats, you write about um, creating a wildflower strip next to a mixed native hedge. Um, I think probably lucky people have got mixed native hedges in their gardens or in you know land that they're sort of adjacent to if you did want to create that kind of strip which i found 
quite a fascinating idea. You know, how could you start that and what type of plants might you put in it? Well, I think you have to keep reminding yourself that it's a garden. It's not a nature reserve and it's not the countryside. So you know, my background is horticulture um, and then natural history, really. So it's about thinking about how you would grow, plant the sorts of species that you want in that in that border if you like um and and just begin to think about ideally um a sunny hedge so that the sun catches the front of the hedge because that's the way you're going to see most of the insects certainly um and then allow enough space so ideally at least a kind of meter so that you can have some taller stuff at the back and shorter stuff at the front but that's that's normal horticulture if you like that's garden design rather than nature reserve design and then the 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 kinds of plants that grow wild in that kind of situation many of them are absolutely beautiful if you think about foxgloves for instance at the back of that border they're woodland edge plants you know they'll grow a meter and a half tall fantastic at this time of year um right down to things like native forget-me-nots and violets and primroses along the front edge um, and things like pink campion for instance in the, in the middle grass so there are a whole range of native wildflowers that grow in that habitat but one of the things that i'm really keen to stress is that because it's a garden i'm not talking ever about kind of being exclusively about native wild plants so there are a lot of very good nectar plants for instance that would thrive in that kind of situation as well so you know you might want along with the foxgloves you might you might want to grow hollyhocks for instance which are not native plants they're kind of classic cottage garden plants they'll grow two feet tall and they'll do really well in that sheltered front of hedge situation as well so there are lots of ways in which i think you can make that kind of habitat even richer in your garden than it would be out in a, a real piece of wild woodland and um and if you can manage to stretch the season longer than you would get out in in the wild then that benefits the wildlife in the garden as well. So planting very early spring bulbs, things like grape hyacinth, for instance, and crocuses that would flower much earlier than anything is, is flowering very much out in the, in the wider landscape. And then letting it run right through to Michaelmas daisies at the end of the summer. Then you can see that for the insects in your garden and your neighbourhood, this is going to be dream habitat because they've got a much longer season to gather their nectar and their pollen. Um, and then if you manage to leave some of those plants to run to seed, then you'll be providing some natural food for the birds in, in the autumn and the winter. So I think it's a combination of being a gardener, but being a gardener whilst thinking that it's not just for you, it's for nature as well. And that if you get it right nature that comes and visits your garden will give you extra pleasure and give you a stronger sense that it's the spring or the summer or the autumn uh, and so much of our landscape has lost that you know you, you can travel through areas where you really couldn't tell whether it was january or july and for me the changing seasons are absolutely the essence of being in a british landscape um, I, I was lucky in my 20s, I worked in the Middle East quite a bit as a landscape architect. And uh, I just, when I first went, I thought, this is great. Blue skies every day, bright sunshine, what's not to like. Within a week, you were desperate for you know, a few clouds and a bit of rain. And that changing season quality of our landscapes is just so special. And it's all reflected in the wildlife. So... The Dern Chorus, the bird song, is a spring thing. The smell of mushrooms is an autumn thing. And you can get all of that woven into your garden if you get it right. Yeah, I like that you you are obviously very observant and I like your idea of documenting your garden developments. Um, and I, I get the impression you have a very excellent knowledge of what wildlife species are visiting your garden um but for say the average person maybe someone like me who doesn't know a lot of bugs and other creatures is there anywhere people can either learn about identifying them or kind of make a shortcut to identifying well the first thing to say is i don't think it matters 
I, I think you can enjoy the dawn chorus in in April and May without knowing the name of a single bird or which bird is making which noise. So just immersing yourself in it, enjoying enjoying watching the bees moving from one flower to another without knowing which bee is which really doesn't matter. And I have to say, uh, I visited um, a specialist nursery last summer uh, that grows plants specifically for pollinators. And I thought I, you know, I, I knew three or four kinds of bees. And the, the woman who was showing me her, her display beds uh, said that she'd counted, I think she said, 47 different species of bees on her flowers. So that put me in my place. I, you know, the knowledge level, you, you, can, you can add to your knowledge forever. But the other thing to say is that actually, um, if, if it bothers you, if you want to know more, then first of all, there are organizations like the Wildlife Trust that organize days out and walks and things with people who do know rather more. And one of the great things that I've been very involved with, with setting up uh, nearly 40 years ago now is International Dawn Chorus Day. And one of the great things about that is that all over the world now, but certainly all over the country, on the first Sunday in May, you can tag along with somebody who will take you out and, and will be listening with you and pointing out that, well, that's a great tip, that's a blue tip, and there's a robin, and that's a wren. Uh, so there are people that you can join in with through the Wildlife Trust and the RSPB and the Woodland Trust and other organizations. But also, I suppose, um, the obvious thing to say is that we're in the age of the app, and there are now a whole lot of um, apps that you can put on your phone that will uh, help you to identify things, whether it's particular wildflowers or particular bees or butterflies. So, you know, you can you can point your camera at the butterfly, take a photograph of it, and it, the app will tell you whether it's a red admiral or a peacock or a small tortoiseshell. So I think, you know, it, it, in one sense, it's easier than it's ever been. But don't forget that it, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't spoil your enjoyment to not know what the name of something is. Uh, it just kind of, I suppose, adds to the pleasure if you actually know a little bit more about how it spends some of its life. So, you know, one of one of the amazing things I think every year is is when the the birds arrive in the garden that have just come in the spring from uh, from Africa, uh, and and then in the autumn, in a, in a few weeks' time, there'll be birds arriving in people's gardens that have come from northern Norway. Well, knowing that makes a bit of a difference to the pleasure that you get, I guess. But actually, just sitting and watching um, a field fair or a red wing uh, and noting how beautiful it is as it strips the fruit off your uh, hawthorn or, or whatever, uh, that's pleasure enough. The fact that you you might know that it, it's uh, it's nested up in, uh, in northern Norway is, is just kind of the cherry on the cake, if you like. Yeah, I think it was important. I think it is important because, again, you mentioned certainly back in the 80s that it was very useful to document your garden wildlife because it might be the case that in, I suppose, a two-pronged way, you could either be protecting existing spaces or helping to protect existing spaces or you could be influencing the way that new developments came about because you, I think, advocate for people contacting or being in contact with and keeping in contact with things like the local planning authorities, um, because that would be a good way to, as I say, influence future decisions. Do you still think that's a good option? Do you still think that's a kind of positive action that people can take? I think it's really important. I think the more you look at the garden, the wildlife in, in your garden, wherever you live, the more you realize that actually you're borrowing most of it from the surrounding landscape. Most of what you enjoy in your garden doesn't live full time in your garden, very little of it. And so it, it depends on what's happening over the garden fence, down the road, in the local park, on the local canal or the railway embankment. And, uh, and so you've got a vested interest suddenly in, in being more interested in what's happening in the locality. And um, back in the 80s, when the whole urban nature conservation movement began, it was very much driven by a, a realization that 
nobody was thinking about the connectivity, for instance, of green spaces in towns and cities. And so you could find that a new development was suddenly plonked onto a patch of railway sidings. And that broke the magic linkage for the local foxes or the local hedgehogs or the birds that were flying through that landscape. Um, I think there's more awareness of that now. Uh, and there's more within the planning world, more of a realization that we need green cities if they're going to, if they're going to cope with climate change, if they're going to be cool as it gets hotter and hotter, if they're going to help to reduce the risk of flooding as the rainstorms get more severe, then Natural areas, green spaces are assuming greater importance amongst the policymakers. But, but that business of being a, a kind of local champion for your local patch, I think, is as important as it ever was, really. And, and lots and lots of people take a really great interest in the immediate landscape. And really, it's very difficult to engage them with the, the bigger, wider landscape pressures. So as a place to begin taking nature and the environment seriously, I think the immediate neighborhood is absolutely crucial. And again, I think that the last few months, last eight, 18 months or so, has really emphasized that to people. I mean, I, it's true of me. I've lived in, in this particular house in this neighborhood for more than 30 years. And I've been championing the green spaces of the black country all that time. Nevertheless, once lockdown arrived, I found that I was walking stretches of canal side towpath, uh, stretches of abandoned railway line, uh, corners of, of the local parks that I'd never visited in 30 years. And I think lots and lots of people, I know because they, they tell me, lots of people are saying, I've discovered areas in my neighborhood I never knew existed. And now I'm really concerned that they're still there for my kids or my grandkids. So I think that local awareness and the importance of it in having nature you can have access to is more important than it's ever been. And there is, I think, greater awareness of it than there's ever been. Um, now, whether that will survive once everybody's able to fly back off to you know, southern Spain or wherever um, remains to be seen. But I think once discovered, that network of local walks and, and green spaces is there in your mind and you're more likely to pick up threats to it. Uh, if you've actually walked in it, heard the birds singing in it, um, you know, seen the, seen the wildlife that lives there and shared it with other people. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And I, I did exactly the same. I went, discovered new areas on foot and it, and it was lovely. Um, if you were to talk to a existing wildlife gardener or somebody who was just coming into it, is there any one thing that you could say to them, please do this or, or maybe please don't do this? Is there one thing that you feel is really important at the moment? I think there's a do and a don't. I, I think really trying your hardest to manage without artificial chemicals, um, pesticides particularly. That's of paramount importance, really. Uh, and it's not that difficult. And there's a huge amount of information. If you look at the, the organic gardening movement, you know, they, they do it without batting an eyelid. And uh, it's all about letting nature restore a balance. I remember at the very first time I did Gardener's World, uh, which is 1979, so that's a very long time ago, and I, I made something called a rich habitat garden. And um, Peter Seabrook, the great Peter Seabrook, was presenting Gardener's World there. And he'd only recently taken over from the even greater Percy Thrower. So that's how long ago it was. And we were filming this, making this garden, and it was at a time when there was an app absolute plague of green fly. I mean, they were, the cameraman was covered in green fly. And Peter looked at me and said, well, go on, then how do you tackle that? But it's extraordinary. If you just leave nature to get on with it, what that kind of plague of green fly led to in lots of gardens was a massive increase in the number of ladybirds. And very quickly, nature was restored to some kind of balance. So avoiding the use of, of pesticides, slug pellets and that kind of thing, that's that's the negative, if you like. Try not to use those materials. And the positive is, if you possibly can, provide some water in the garden. Um, I'm lucky. I've got a, a reasonable-sized pond in my front garden, which is a delight. It tells me what the weather's like every day. It brings wildlife into the garden that wouldn't otherwise visit. But my very first 
pond um, was a, was actually a stone sink uh, in a garden uh, that I filled with water, planted some plants in it, and within half an hour there were uh, pond skaters on the top of the water, and and extraordinarily wildlife finds water. So if you can positively fit in a, a pond or a, even a bubbler fountain for the birds, that will do more, I think, to make your garden a magnet for wildlife than almost anything else you can do. Mm. You've actually inspired me. I'm going to put one in at a site where I work, uh, having read your book. So Great, you won't be disappointed. No, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, well, Chris, that's the end of my questions. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to include, or are you happy with that? No, I'm, I'm happy with that. The only other thing perhaps to say is that um, you mentioned How to Make a Wildlife Garden, which which was first published back in 1985, I think. Um, and the miraculous thing about that book is that it's been in print ever since. And that's such a rarity for gardening books. You know, they, they last six months and then they're out of print. So it's it's been re printed and, and uh, updated a couple of times. And just last week, the publishers agreed that we would add an extra chapter and it would come out as another new edition uh, next autumn when I'll get a chance to talk rather more about the wider landscape and the influence, the kind of thing we've been talking about, the way that wildlife gardening over the last 40 years is now being seen as influencing the wider landscape, the countryside and so on. So that's, for me, that's, really exciting but just having it in print for nearly three generations now is really special for me and uh, I know because I meet lots of people who say I bought your book in 1986 or something and now my grandkids are using it for their new garden uh, that's that's really satisfying thank you Chris do keep an eye out for the new edition of how to make a wildlife garden next year also thanks to listener Angus for recommending I speak to Chris If you have any guest or topic suggestions, do let me know. I'll always look into them and try to oblige. Unless I think the topic has been done to death, or the person is a plonker, which does happen on occasion. Thanks to you for listening. If you haven't already done so, please, please do rate and review the podcast and share the episodes on social media so more people get to hear from the amazing guests on the show. Now here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a perennial pest of the vegetable garden. I reckon it's safe to say that anyone who's tried growing their own carrots and parsnips will have come across a troublesome little plant pest called the carrot root fly. Rarely recognised as adults, these small shiny black flies with reddish legs will be emerging throughout the year from their underground pupae. Then after mating, the females will take to the air and follow the scent given off by umbellifers, the family of aromatic plants that carrot and parsnip belong to. On finding the plants, the flies land and begin laying their eggs into the soil, which after a few days hatch into tiny white maggots that initially feed on the plant's root hairs before tunnelling their way into the primary root. At this stage, the only sign of their presence will be a small circular entry hole into the root. But as time goes by, their infestation becomes much more obvious causing open wounds across the root that trigger the plant into producing anthocyanin, a damage-mitigating pigment that'll start turning their leaves red. Then when the maggots mature, they disperse from the root to pupate within the surrounding soil, where over the following weeks, they begin hatching sporadically into the adults that'll produce the often unsynchronized second generation of carrot root fly. Then as the year comes to an end, the second generation's maggots will either have pupated back into the soil to overwinter, or they'll remain as dormant maggots within the umbellifa roots until the following spring. Dealing with carrot root fly, though, is never going to be easy, and often a degree of infestation might have to be accepted, since there are no pesticides allowed for home use, and only debatable levels of success from the commercially available biological control agents. Even the traditional methods of using barriers and companion plants to block and repel the adult flies have never consistently been proven to work. However, it'll certainly be worth trying them, perhaps with a root fly tolerant cultivar, and if possible, in an area where umbellifers 
which include parsley, haven't been grown for a year or two. And also covering the newly sown seeds with an insect-proof netting or fleece. But whatever defence is planned against carrot root fly, it's important to remember to dig up and to remove any remaining umbellifers before the end of winter, as these will likely contain dormant maggots. And by turning over the soil a few times before the start of spring, the overwintering pupae can be exposed to frosts and to the insectivorous birds. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast. 